stroke of fate. The fate of you who are listening, of nations, of the world, has often hung upon accident or upon decisions that made another way would have substantially altered the course of human events. Suppose by a stroke of fate, Eli Whitney had failed to invent the cotton gin. Would slavery have disappeared from the South before the Civil War? Suppose fate had decreed that the one vote by which Congress failed to impeach President Johnson had been cast for his impeachment. Yes, much depends upon a stroke of fate. And tonight we rewrite history as we present... The stroke of fate that could have made Russia our neighbor in Alaska today. It is almost impossible to overestimate the importance of our purchase of Alaska, or Russian America, as it was called up to 1867. For had that purchase not been completed, the United States and Canada might very well today have Russia as their next-door neighbor, with all that implies. Our story tonight is historically true for about two-thirds of our drama, when the stroke of fate occurs which changes history. After that, we are guided by speculation. Our story is related by the Secretary of State in the cabinets of Lincoln and Andrew Johnson, William H. Seward. I've always been a staunch believer in the manifest destiny of the United States, its destiny to expand its boundaries, even as far as Russian America, or Alaska, as it was later called. There had been negotiations for the purchase of this vast territory by the United States for some time. And its sale to us became imminent when in February 1867, in St. Petersburg, Russia, there was a meeting of the Imperial Council. Among those present were Tsar Alexander II, his brother, the Grand Duke Constantine, and the Foreign Minister, Prince Gorchakov. Your Imperial Majesty. Yes, Duke Constantine. I am of the opinion that we should inform the United States as soon as possible that we will sell Russian America to her for the sum of five million American dollars. Your Imperial Majesty. You have objections, Prince Gorchakov? Uh, Sire, during the administration of the American President Buchanan, we were offered five million dollars and we deferred the sale. I believe we should not now sell for less than 10 million American dollars. And if the Americans will not pay 10 million dollars, Prince Korchakov? Then I hesitate to recommend that we should sell, at least at present. There may be untold wealth in Russian America. We know there has been gold found along the Stikin River. But the ore is of extremely low-grade quality and scarcely worth the cost of mining. Sire, in addition to the territories proving unprofitable, there are other vital reasons why we should sell. I have read the memoranda from the Imperial Council, and I agree with the majority. Russian America is too distant from us to govern well. Britain is desirous of seizing it, and the cost of our sending troops to protect it would be more than Russian America is worth, especially as we prefer to consolidate our power in Korea and elsewhere in the Far East. Prince Gorchakov. Yes, sir. You will please inform our minister to the United States, Baron de Steckel, that he is to resume negotiations with the United States for its purchase of Russian America. In March 1867, the Russian minister to the United States, Baron Eduard de Steckel, paid me a visit at the State Department in Washington. As always, it is a pleasure to see you, Mr. Seward. Thank you, Baron de Steckel. I trust you enjoyed your leave of absence in St. Petersburg. I did indeed. Baron, I have a favor to ask you. Yes? As I have a petition from the Washington Territorial Legislature requesting permission from our government for Washington citizens to fish in the waters near the coast of Russian America. I'm sorry, Mr. Seward, but I'm certain the imperial government will not grant that permission. Baron, uh, would your government then consider selling us Russian America outright? Possibly, if the offer were sufficient. Yeah. I think Congress might be persuaded to grant as much as $5 million for such purpose. I do not believe the imperial government would accept less than $10 million. Well, I think the United States might go as high as... Five million, five hundred thousand. 
Mr. Seward, there is a bare possibility Russia might accept nine million dollars, but nothing under that figure. With the problem of these negotiations occupying my thoughts night and day, it was natural for me to discuss them not only with my son Frederick, the Assistant Secretary of State, but also with my daughter-in-law Anna, who since the death of my beloved wife two years before had become one of my close confidants. And one evening when I arrived home... Father is that you? Yes, Anna. Good evening, Father. Good evening, my dear. Anna, we've done it. Baron de Steckel and I have just drawn up an outline for a treaty ceding Russian America to the United States. And tomorrow I'm presenting it to President Johnson and the cabinet for approval. Oh, I'm glad, Father. Congratulations. <laughs> well, thank you, my dear. It's a great bargain. Over 560,000 square miles for $7,200,000. Anna, this territory has a wealth of lumber, furs, fisheries, coal, and other minerals. Russia couldn't develop them. But Yankee ingenuity will. But, Father, are you sure the Senate will ratify your treaty? Well, first, we have to worry about the czars agreeing to the treaty, to the purchase price and the terms. As for the Senate, well, I think I can enlist the aid of Senator Sumner. He'll be a great help with his Foreign Relations Committee. Very few senators know anything about Russian America. But you'll see they find out, Father, won't you? Yes, Anna. I'll invite them here to dinner. The dinner table will be spread with roast treaty, boil treaty, and treaty garnished with appointments to offices they'll be able to give their constituents. Father. Anna, we're buying more than potential wealth when we buy this territory. For the more of this continent that is ours, the safer is the United States. <laughs> Our outline of the Treaty of Purchase was approved by President Andrew Johnson and his cabinet. On March 25th, Baron de Steckel cabled a summary of the proposed treaty to Prince Gorchakov. The evening of March 29th, I had a little family gathering in my home. We were playing cards, whist. I hope my next hand is better. I, I uh, believe it is my deal. Father, Father. Oh, uh, yes, Anna? Baron de Steckel is here to see you. At this hour? Oh, uh, will you take my place at the table, dear? Of course, Father Seward. Why, I believe it's my deal. Now, good evening, Baron. Mr. Seward, I have a dispatch from my government by cable. The emperor gives his consent to the session of Russian America. Excellent. Tomorrow, if you like, I will come to the department and we can enter upon the treaty. Well, why wait until tomorrow? Let us draw up the entire treaty tonight. But your department is closed. You have no clerks, and uh, my secretaries are scattered about the town. Well, never mind that. If you can muster your legation together before midnight, you will find me awaiting you at the department, which will be open and ready for business. Baron de Steckel agreed. I immediately sent word to Charles Sumner, chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, and asked him to join us. In the presence of Mr. Sumner, the Assistant Secretary of State and several clerks, Baron de Steckel and I completed drawing up the treaty at 4 o'clock Saturday morning, March 30th, 1867. That same day, President Johnson had it sent to the Senate for approval. On April 2nd, the purchase treaty was considered by the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. Afterwards, Mr. Sumner, as chairman, came to see me. Well, I'm certain my committee will report favorably on the ratifying of this treaty, but I believe its consideration by the entire Senate should be postponed. But why, Charles? I've had a canvas of the Senate made. The necessary two-thirds of the members are not in favor of it. They know very little about Russian America and they're influenced by the violent opposition of a press which knows less. I know. Territories being called a, a sucked orange. Yeah. That's the New York world for you. A, a frozen wilderness. It's worthless. The fur-bearing animals are extinct hmm. and the purchase price is too great. The purchase price is too great. At two cents an acre. Yeah. Well, it's up hmm. to you, Charles, to convince your colleagues. Now, we'll... You know I'm for this as much as you are, but nevertheless, perhaps we should wait until... Charles, this treaty must go through as quickly as possible. 
The Tsar is friendly. He's willing to sell now. But we must remember that he is an absolute monarch, and something can happen to make him change his mind. On April 8, 1867, the treaty was favorably reported out of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. And on April 9th, it was submitted to the Senate for ratification. Charles Sumner made a speech more than three hours long, urging its passage. In conclusion, he suggested that in place of Russian America, the territory now be called by its native name, Alaska, meaning Great Land. Will, the Senate has ratified the treaty 37 to 2. The country should be very grateful to you, Charles. Uh, thank you, Will. But you're going to have a great deal of trouble, Will, when the president asks the House of Representatives to appropriate the money for Alaska. Well, why do you say that? Well, some of the congressmen were furious that the House had not been consulted about this treaty. But constitutionally, the treaty-making powers are lodged only in the president and the Senate. Yes, I know, Will. But the president is going to have to ask the House to vote that money for the purchase. And these representatives are going to challenge the right of the president and the Senate to oblige them to make an appropriation. They say we're trying to force them into it without their having been consulted in the first place. And besides, they detest the president. Ah, you'd better be prepared for trouble, Will. Considerable trouble. Ratifications of the Treaty of Purchase were exchanged between us and Imperial Russia on June 20th, 1867. Pending the voting of the purchase price by the House and certainly money would be voted. On October 18th, there were ceremonies at Sitka, capital of Alaska, during which there was a formal transfer of the territory from Imperial Russia to the United States. Amid cannon salutes, the Russian colors were lowered. and stripes were raised. On December 3rd, 1867, President Johnson requested the House appropriate the money for the Alaskan purchase. And there was a storm of protest. Oh, 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 oh. Because of Seward's folly, we are to pay over $7 million for a land that is utterly worth where it rains over 300 days a year, where domestic animals are unknown, and man can find no food except fish. None but criminals would ever live in such a place. <laughs> the existence of us in the House has been ignored by the President and Senate until now, when it is demanded that we appropriate $7,200,000 for this worthless Alaska. We're not asked to do it. We're told we must do it. Well, we need it. And we won't. are listening to a dramatic conception of the stroke of fate that might have made Russia our neighbor in Alaska today. Our story has been historically true so far and continues to be up to the stroke of fate that might have changed history from then on speculation based on historical possibility. <laughs> over the Alaska Purchase Appropriation continued in the House throughout January and February 1868. 
Meanwhile, the attacks on the treaty, on the president, and on me mounted. I was working in my study one evening when... Father, it's Anna. May I come in? Oh, yes, my dear. Father Seward, you're not looking at all well. Can't you find time to take a vacation from Washington? Just a short vacation. Now, Anna? When I'm bending every effort to convince the opposition they must vote for this Alaska appropriations? No, my dear. But your health... I keep reminding them there's a provision in the treaty that the money must be paid within ten months after the exchange of ratifications. By April 19th of this year. The time is running out. And still they wrangle and argue. You know, we could lose Alaska. But wouldn't Russia be willing to extend the date for payment? Probably, but not necessarily. If we don't pay in time, the Tsar could change his mind. Then we'd have to get out of Alaska. I'm not saying it will happen, mind you, but it could. These awful attacks they make upon you. These demands for your resignation. It's dreadful. Attacks, Anna? To be in politics and not to be attacked? Well... This may happen in paradise, but never in Washington. The angels uh, of Congress are made of sterner stuff. But to call Alaska Seward's folly. Let them call it anything they wish as long as they appropriate money to buy it. But we do have some good friends in Congress, Anna. You know, I like what General Nathaniel Banks of Massachusetts has said in the House the other day. Yes, this purchase is necessary for the defense of the United States, for preservation of its institutions and of its power. That's it. It was a good speech. And Banks is right, Anna. We must have Alaska. Some of the opposition within Congress stemmed from dislike of President Johnson, who, of course, favored the appropriation and whom Congress was determined to impeach with the excuse being his violation of the Tenure of Office Act. Debate on the Alaska appropriation became so bitter and divided, it was determined to postpone its further consideration until after the impeachment trial against the president. Meanwhile, in Alaska and Russia, events occurred which were to change the course of history. Early in April, Prince Gorchakov, the Russian foreign minister, called on the Grand Duke Constantine. Your Highness. Yes, Prince Korchakov. I have just received word from our former governor of Russian America, Prince Maksutov, that several prospectors, Russians, our own nationals, have discovered vast quantities of gold in the Nome Peninsula of Russian America. But we have known for years there was some gold in that territory. Yes, but this is not low-grade ore. It is high-grade of the same rich quality as that discovered in California. You are certain this is not just a rumor? Prince Maksutov has verified it. It is true. And everybody concerned has been sworn to secrecy. The discovery was made so far from Sitka, where the Americans now are, that it has been possible to keep them from learning about it. We must communicate this immediately to His Imperial Majesty. Gold has been discovered in the Nome Peninsula. Well? Sire... This is apparently a gold discovery of the greatest proportions. Your Imperial Majesty, this may be of incalculable wealth. Hundreds of millions of rubles worth of gold have been taken from the California gold fields. This discovery may be worth as much or even more. But we have already ceded Russian America to the United States. Pardon, sire. But according to the treaty, the Americans must pay us the purchase price by midnight of April 19th. This is now April 2nd. If they have not paid Russia by that time... We can declare the treaty to be null and void. And risk losing the friendship of the United States? But, Your Imperial Majesty, we have acted in good faith. We have even, pending payment, transferred the territory to the United States. It is they who may well fail to live up to the agreement. Justice is on our side. Sire, the territory was unprofitable for us. But now, why sell for seven million American dollars what we know to be worth a great deal more? With this gold, we can finance our expansion in the Far East. But let us suppose that if we are not paid by the 19th, we declare the treaty to be void and we officially reoccupy the territory. When the gold discovery becomes known, 
Americans and Canadians will pour into the territory, and either the United States or Britain will annex it. Not if we send sufficient troops for protection, sire, and decide to govern it well. Sire, Russian America might well become our treasure house. I will consider what to do. And in the meantime, complete secrecy must be observed so that this news does not become public. Mr. Seward, you requested that I come to see you? Uh, yes, Baron Steckel. Uh, won't you please sit down? Thank you. Baron, I have a request to make of you. I, I'm sure granting it will be just a matter of form. Yes, Mr. Seward. The time for our payment of the Alaskan purchase price runs out in a few days. I wish to ask that the payment date be extended, say, three months. I'm sorry, Mr. Seward, but that cannot be done. Cannot be done? I have received cabled instructions from the foreign minister that if the $7,200,000 are not voted by midnight April 19th, Russia will declare the treaty to be void. But in heaven's name, why? Mr. Seward, I have no knowledge whatsoever of the reasons for this instruction. I am as surprised as you are. But if payment is not made by midnight April 19th... Anna, this is a frightful blow. It's what you were afraid might happen, Father Seward. As long as the House postponed voting the money, this was always a possibility. But in my heart, I believe we could get an extension in the payment date if necessary. And now we're on the verge of losing Alaska. But why has the Tsar changed his mind? I have no idea. Perhaps there's been some change in foreign policy that makes Alaska valuable to Russia now when it wasn't before. Meanwhile, Congress is more interested in trying to impeach the president than in saving Alaska for us. What do you intend to do about it, Father Seward? I am invited to a gathering at General Banks' house tomorrow evening. A couple of the influential leaders of the opposition will be there. I must convince them they've got to interrupt the impeachment proceedings long enough to vote that money. Congressman, I uh, wonder if I could talk to you privately for a few minutes. Oh, yes, sir, if you wish. General Banks has offered me the use of his study. Good evening, Will. Oh, good evening, Charles. Congressman, you've been outspoken in your opposition to paying for Alaska. That much money? I certainly have. It's not worth it. But sooner or later, under ordinary circumstances, the House would vote that appropriation. Maybe. But we're in honor bound to pay. Our national honor is at stake. Not any longer. It's the Russians who are changing their minds. Only because the dilatory tactics of the House have given them that opportunity. Congressman, can't these impeachment proceedings be interrupted long enough to vote for this appropriation? Debate on the bill was postponed because of the amount of opposition. And there's still enough opposition to keep it from passing now. But you're the leader of the opposition. And unless you bring your influence to bear, we'll lose Alaska. Good riddance. I've never been in favor of that treaty, Sword. As far as I'm concerned, Alaska is still just a dreary waste of glaciers, icebergs, white bears, and walrus. It means expelling another monarch from this continent. Why expel the Tsar? Imperial Russia is our friend. Britain isn't. If that's your argument, we'd be better off trying to buy or annex the Canadian provinces. But we're not buying the Canadian provinces. And Alaska can be ours. She must be. I'm sorry, Seward, but I just can't see it your way. Anna, tomorrow is our last chance. Unless the Alaska appropriation bill comes to a vote by then, and the vote is favorable... Is there no hope? Very, very little. Oh, that must be Senator Sumner. I'm expecting him. I'll answer the door. Well, Charles? Will, I've had some of our most influential congressmen speak to the opposition leaders in the House. I've pleaded them with them myself. And? 
It's no use. It'll take a miracle to save Alaska for us. There was no miracle. Today is May 16th, 1868. Today, by one vote, Congress failed to impeach President Johnson. And today, the stars and stripes are being lowered in Sitka, Alaska. And the imperial Russian flag is being raised. It is my dearest hope that, as I love my country, never will we regret that Alaska still belongs to Russia and not to the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, please recall this scene in which the stroke of fit occurred which might have indeed changed history. Your Highness? Yes, Prince Korchakov. I have just received word from Russian America that several prospectors, Russians, have discovered vast quantities of gold in the Nome Peninsula, gold of the same rich quality as that found in California. And here to explain the significance of our stroke of fate and to speculate further is our consultant on tonight's program, the eminent historian editor of the Encyclopedia of American History and professor of history at Columbia University, Dr. Richard B. Morris. It was fortunate that gold was discovered around Nome in 1899 instead of in 1868, as in tonight's story. Had the Russian negotiators been aware of Alaska's potential riches and the gold in the Klondike just east of Alaska, it is not unlikely the Tsar would have changed his mind. An absolute monarch... He could have called off the deal for any number of reasons once we failed to live up to the purchase agreement. In actuality, Seward managed to get the Russians to extend the time limit for payment, and the Alaskan Appropriation Bill was finally passed on July 14, 1868. Today, few, if any, Americans would be prepared to deny that Seward's folly was one of the most brilliant investments in American history. Economically, Alaska has paid for itself scores of times. But... Far more important, the purchase of Alaska proved to be one of the most fortunate strokes of fate for our country's military security. Had Russia kept Alaska, either of two unfortunate eventualities could have occurred. In the first place, Russia, whose fleet was annihilated by the Japanese in 1905, could not have defended Alaska from Japanese invasion. Had Japan then consolidated her position in Alaska as she did in East Asia, the Pearl Harbor disaster of 1941 might have been no more than a minor tragedy of World War II. That date, which will live in infamy, could well have seen a sneak attack from Alaska against America's major industrial targets, and the entire course and strategy of our war in the Pacific would have been altered. On the other hand, President Theodore Roosevelt, who mediated peace between Russia and Japan in 1905, might conceivably have forced Japan to keep her hands off Alaska by courageously applying the Monroe Doctrine. If so, the Soviet Union today would be in control of air bases within striking distance of our great cities. The strategic Arctic route for the joint defense of Canada and the United States against communist aggression would be virtually sealed off, and every part of our country would be within range of Soviet planes carrying thermonuclear devastation. Yes, for America and the democracies of the West, it was indeed a fortunate stroke of fate that Alaska did not remain in Russian hands. Thank you, Dr. Morris. We invite you to listen next week to hear what might have happened if... By a stroke of fate, Alexander the Great had lived beyond the age of 32 and continued his conquest of the world. Featured in tonight's Stroke of Fate presentation was Cameron Prudhomme as William H. Seward. Others in the cast were Stefan Schnabel, Humphrey Davis, Danny Ako, Roger DeCoven, Monia Sheon, Peter Capel, and Boris Aplon. Your announcer is Lionel Rico. Stroke of Fate is produced by Morton Lester Lewis, conceived and written by Mort Lewis, directed by Fred Way, prepared in consultation with the Society of American Historians. <laughs> This is the NBC Radio Network.